Welcome to Ask Girl Anything. This is the show where your questions make the show. Without your questions, we don't have much of a show. So this week, um, I've got four questions. Um, last week, I had four or five questions. Um, I think I had some interesting questions this week. I don't know if it's going to be a long show or a short show. I never really do. A um, uh, couple things, a couple shout outs, a couple things to think about. Um, I'm approaching 2,000 subscribers, okay, and in, in that approach of 2,000 subscribers, I'm putting out some interesting content. Uh, one of the videos I'm putting out this week was actually showing my process for making drum videos. One of the questions I got the week before was about how I release content, when I release content. As a matter of fact, that'll be my first question we'll start with, but my process for making videos these days, I used to use a DSLR camera. And what that required of me was to sit here and play and then get up and get the camera every 11 minutes. And I had to know, keep my eye on time. And if I was getting into something, sometimes I had to stop to go get the camera. So now my new process for making videos is using an iPhone XR and my iPhone 6S. And if I do two cameras, that's it. Every once in a while, I'm going to do a three or four camera video and I'll bring in my really bad Chinese knockoff GoPro or I'll bring in my DSLR. But for the most part, what I've been doing content wise lately is one or two cameras only because number one, I don't get a lot of joy out of making six camera shots and I don't have a great set of cameras. Now, maybe if I buy a couple more cameras, I'll get a little bit more into that side of it. Plus, my lighting's a little weird, even though I've upped my lighting up in here. But the main reason why is, when I make a video, a drum cover video especially, I basically turn the camera on from the first time I sit down to practice the song or play through it. And if I get lucky enough to nail it in one or two or three takes, you're actually seeing me practicing it. It's not three times me recording it, it's I just hit record and I start playing. That's just what I do. So the last video I released, or made, I don't know if it's the last video I released because I don't know when I'm going to release this video, but a video I released midweek is a video of Elton John, Kiki D, Don't Go Breaking My Heart. I actually have three versions of the video, um, two that are what I consider good versions, and one that was, wasn't a bad version, it just was an in-process version. It was version number three, take three. Uh, this is the third time I'm playing the song. The first two times I'm just playing through it. I put, took it off of YouTube and then I, you know, brought it into Logic and then started playing. But the third take, I started playing. I had a nice pocket. I think the first half of the song is really nice groove, nice pocket. I'm kind of remembering the song from listening to it as a kid, and then all of a sudden, I did something and it bothered me, and I said, ah, I'm not going to use this take. And at that point, something triggered in my brain to keep playing. Now, a lot of times what triggers in my brain is stop and start over again. And a lot of times when I have like 10, 11 takes, I'll have five or six half takes or partial takes, okay? Um, this was one of those times where I snapped, I said, oh, I'm not going to use this. And then I did a fill and I just threw something in. And then I kept getting into it and vamping and doing more and more. And I just went completely berserk. So this is a take of me just going off the chain, but it was my third take and it was just me just going off and letting off some steam. And I, you know, I like to play, but I don't. I don't pick covers to show off my chops, if you know what I mean. I pick covers to play music, because I believe drumming's about playing music. So this was one, this was me just playing my, as much of my chops as I could think of playing at that point. And it's just me riffing the last minute and a half or two minutes of the tune out. So I had a lot of fun with that, but it kind of brings me to that, you know, one of the questions we have this week, you know, how, what's your process for making videos? What's your thoughts about how to grow your channel? And I got a follow-up question from Eric DeWeese. So I'm going to start with Eric's question, I believe. Um, and Eric said, I do have a follow-up question, 
do you have a sense of what days of the week are the best days to release videos? I've noticed I release videos on Fridays when they tend to be more views than Wednesdays, for example, or thought, what's your thoughts on it? Well, Eric, to be honest, I am starting to look at that. I have found that the, the weekends get the best views, and that's probably why I've traditionally put out Ask Girl Anything on the weekend. One thing I like to do is get Ask Girl Anything out on a Friday, you know, most times, Friday or Saturday, but I've done it occasionally on a Sunday, but you get it out on the weekends, people do watch it. And then I usually do a follow-up video the day after Ask Girl Anything, or a day and a half after Ask Girl Anything, and release that so I get some momentum. And usually if you release it by Monday, you've pretty much hit the sweet spot. Somewhere between Thursday and Monday, if you get one or two videos in there, you'll get more views, in my opinion. And then the midweek stuff, though, is important because if you want to keep the YouTube content people happy and they'll keep throwing your videos into the, the mix, you got to keep throwing more content out. At least that's what I have found. Now, I will say this. Once you have videos over 10,000 views, they get in rotations that you don't have any understanding about. So, I mean, and I think that's how drum channels that where they're not putting out as many videos are growing like wildfire. I was just looking at um, my friend Jeremy, a little drummer channel, and I was like, did I miss any Jeremy videos? And I, I love Jeremy's stuff. He's a great player. And I went over there, and the last video he did was like three weeks ago, or two and a half weeks ago. And But he's got 11,000 subscribers. And when I started following Jeremy, it was somewhere around 7,000 subscribers. So he's just growing exponentially right now. And I think that's what happens. It's, it's like an exponential thing. You know, you get, you get to a thousand, that's one place. You get to the second thousand, that's another place. Then you get to the next that, two thousand and maybe you get to four thousand and it just starts to grow. And if you can get a couple videos to kind of get in the queue, all of a sudden you grow with it. So YouTube's an exponential thing, you know, but for me, YouTube's more than just drum covers and ask girl anything and getting subscribers. For me, it's become a community. And um, I've been kind of blessed that I, I've met some interesting people through the community. Um, and I've got some pro-line drummers I've met, people that are touring drummers, friends of mine now, acquaintance of mine on YouTube, um, guys that you know are in LA or New York or even in England and I'm just like really stoked that I get to meet some interesting people that find me somehow or I connect with them, you know? So YouTube's, a, it's another thing, you know what I mean? Also, it's been getting me work this year. I mean, people are finding my drumming and asking me to collaborate or asking me to play on their album like Kelly last week. So, I mean, YouTube's become so much more than just making drum covers and the great community I have here. but. I have a friend of mine who I'm going to interview one of these days who's a pro drummer from New York who I didn't meet on YouTube, but he came down to my studio about almost five years ago, four years ago, I guess it was. His name's John Favicchia, and he's been kind of following what I've been doing, and he says something to me. He says, well, you really got great engagement, and I think that's a big part of the YouTube thing is the community and the engagement. So I thank all of you who spend time writing comments. And as you know, I try to write comments back. And um, the people that just love watching drum covers, um, people like uh, Sherry, Grem Sherry Gemerick, I think her last name is, you know. Um, Gigi Drummer always watches my videos. There's certain people that always watch my videos, you know. And I mean, they don't put out a lot of content or don't put any content out. But I appreciate you guys and ladies watching my videos. That's really says something to me. You know, so that's huge. But I do think, Eric, there is something to what day you release covers if you want to get views. But I think the overall, you've got to be releasing enough content to get pushed into that next level. So, all right. My next question is from 2112 Drums. And 2112 Drums goes, I have another question for Ask Girl Anything. Have you ever played a steel drum? And the answer to that question is no, I have played a steel drum like in a music store, but I don't play steel drum. Melodic instruments 
like mallet instruments or timpani. I've played these instruments, but like something like a steel drum, which is kind of like you got to be vibey on and you've got to be able to improvise on. I've never, I don't have the ear, you know? I, I mean, there are guys that have great melodic ears and I'm not one of them. I have a rhythmic ear apparently, but I don't have that melodic ear. Um, I do have this one interesting drum, it's called a happy drum, and I was going to do something where I wrote something using the happy drum and some pads, and then some played some percussion and stuff, you know, you know, kind of make some spa music, or yoga music, as I call it, because this has got that kind of vibe to it. But as far as like steel drums, playing like reggae or calypso music, I've never really had an affinity to playing it. I mean, I've goofed around on them. When I see them and I've been around somebody who has one, I might touch it because I can approach it from a percussionistic standpoint. But playing it is a whole different ballgame, you know. And I, I have too much respect for musicians and the different instruments. And I think the hardest thing for me playing a melodic instrument is not so much me understanding it harmonically and stuff. Because I, I think that's how I get through music is harmonically hearing things. But I think for me now at this age it's hard to start another instrument and feel competent on it. You know, once you hit a certain level of competency on your main instrument, it's hard to go there. That's why if you're young, play everything and see what you like playing and enjoy it. And then once you figure out what you like to play, zone in and get it all. But that experience of playing piano like I had in college or playing marimba and vibraphone in college, that was really important. But I don't have a $5,000 vibraphone and I don't have one in the studio and I never had a love for it. And if I had a love for it, I would have had that. That would have been my thing, but it wasn't. So anyhow, great question, 2112. Uh, the next question comes from Brian Corey. He says, for next week, do you, do you think of the, uh, what do you think? It's what do you think? What do you think of the new K cluster crashes from Zildjian that recently came out in the winter NAM? Well, I kind of said something about symbols last week about discontinuing lines and adding lines and stuff. I think right now, my biggest problem with the symbol market is there's so many different lines and so many different sub lines of main lines. And then these sub lines get discontinued. You just don't know when they're gonna get discontinued. So if you hear something, here's my recommendation to you. If you hear something you like, Buy it now while it's still out there because the K cluster cl cluster class K cluster crashes may not be around in a couple of years. It may be a sound that comes and goes. And that's always been that way with Zildjian, but the difference was those sounds that came and went, you know, from medium to heavy, you know, to ping rides to rock rides, they were varying degrees. Now it's so diverse. I mean, with all the effect symbols, all the overhammered symbols, all the dry symbols, all the unlaid symbols, I don't think they're all going to stay there forever. Okay. So if you find something you like, buy it now. Um, as far as my opinion on the overclustered or the cluster crashes, they're okay. Um, matter of fact, I think they might go with the Kuropes. If I got one of those, it'd be kind of cool to play with the Kuropes. Um, I think the dark dry thing is the next area for me to explore in Zildjian's possibly. But for me, I've really grown to love my Giant Beats and my Peisty 2002s. And I've come back to the middle of, of Sonic, um, not the darkness, the middle of the road sits in the mix really well stuff. You know what I mean? And that's kind of my, where my ear's at now. So I'm back in an A Zildjian world again. For years, I was trying to go K, and then I got Kuropes, and then all of a sudden, I've become back into like an A Zildjian, you know, world. I don't know. Peisty 2002s are their version of, of an A Zildjian that's kind of bright and not bright, bright, not like overly bright, but just kind of like they sit in the mix a certain way. And I think the darker stuff has got a place, but doesn't necessarily sit in the mix the same way. Like my Kuropes don't sit in the mix. I, I think if you want a wash ride on the Kurope, it's great. If you want to get a nice pingy sound that's going to cut, be a part of the track, I think you'll lose it. Um, where I think the Peisty 2002s have got a nice pingy ride, but they're not overly pingy. 
and they just sit in the mix. Giant beats, perfect cymbals. I mean, I used last night, I had a rehearsal. By the way, I told you I'm playing with the Swigs in a couple weeks. I don't know if I'll do any video from that. But um, brought my Giant Beat 20. It's 2002 16 Thin Crash, my 505 hats to rehearsal last night. It killed. 20 inch Giant Beats, multi, is just a great all use cymbal, just like this 22 is just, just a little bigger version of it. So that's what I like. I'm into cymbals you can be crashed on and ride on. They're not one trick wonders. And I find a lot of these dark, unlathed, K -cust cluster type, K dark, special dark K, special this, blah, blah, blah. They're one trick wonders. You gotta love the sound, you gotta want that sound. And of course, if you want it, it's good to you, then you should get it. That's what I always say. So you use what's good for you. And that's the key. Use what's good for you, what makes you bring and inspires you to bring out the music inside of you. So, Brian, that's what I would say to you. Great question, though. Um, my last question comes from Lori Jones again. Lori asked this question last week, I think. And he said to me, simple question, what gigs or venues over the years stand out to you? Great, funny, strange, both good or bad, cheers. All right, I've got a couple gigs I've talked about. Um, there's been a couple I've talked about over the years. So let me review a few classic gigs, important gigs for me, all right? And then I'll, I'll deal with some of the crazy gigs. So, going back in my career, I would say playing the Creation Festival that I talked about a couple weeks ago, playing on a big stage over for 30,000 people or 10,000 people that day, that was a big deal. That was a big event for me. First time you ever hear yourself in the monitors is a big event, okay? Um, I think also sharing the stage with some big bands um, was another aspect of that. Um, like I've done, I've done festivals with some Christian artists that I respected and liked. So being there with them made those events kind of cool. And Creation Fest was one of those for sure. Um, I did a gig back in the nineties. It's called, it was called a psycho Billy gig. And I've talked, I've told this story before. I don't know how long ago I told it. But the Psychobilly gig is an interesting music. It's it's kind of like rockabilly, stray cats meets heavy metal. And the guy who wrote the songs, he knew a friend of mine who said, yeah, let ask my friend to play with you. I was 37, he was probably 25. He had a bass player, his girl bass player was like 19, maybe 20, um, who didn't come to rehearsal, by the way. So we had a rehearsal, I got a tape. And I listened to the music and then we did the rehearsal and it was all that really fast, that kind of stuff, really loud and pushing hard. And I rehearsed with the guitar player and then I went to the gig. And when I got to the gig, the bass player was this girl, 19. She was in a mini skirt. She had fishnet stockings on. She was playing upright bass. And when the, we played, we just started playing the gig and I was watching her off to the side of me and she's jumping up on the bass, she's slapping it, she's bleeding on it and she's like, almost like climbing on the bass in a manner that really was a little over the top, if you know what I mean. I mean, it was like she was, it's like she was doing the bass, that's what it was like and it was crazy and I had family and friends there that, that gig and they were like they couldn't believe what they were seeing that was one of my crazy gigs that was crazy that gig so I, I mean I I never played with them again but that was one of the crazy gigs I've done in my lifetime um well, I'm trying to think what else have I done crazy gig wise you know most of my gigs were I'm not going to say uneventful. I would say I had some awesome times playing with my wife and our own wedding band back in the 80s and then playing with friends in the 90s when we had pickup bands to do weddings and casual gigs. Um, one of the most memorable gigs with that band was a firehouse gig we did. 
and we were playing this song, I've Had the Time of My Life. I've had the time of my life, and I owe it all to you. Doom, chop, doom, do, doom, chick a doom, doom. The bass part comes in. Well, as soon as the bass part came in, the bass player started like, doom, chop, doom, do, doom, chick a doom, doom, chop, doom, do, doom, chick a doom. All of a sudden, smoke started coming out of his bass amp, which was right next to me, right off the side of my hi hat. Then a flame shot out of it, and a fire started in his amp. And we were in a firehouse. And the guy behind the bar was a fireman. He didn't know what the heck to do. Where's the fire extinguisher? It was crazy. It took him a couple seconds to get the fire extinguisher and put the, put the amp out in the middle of the song. That was pretty funny. Yeah, I've done a few gigs like that where those kinds of mishaps have happened. Um, i trying to think what else. I've done gigs... I've done gigs in all kinds of places. Like, I've played out in prison yards, in prisons. Um, those are memorable, memorable events when you get your equipment out in the middle of the basketball court and you got all the inmates watching you. And, you know, my heart went out to those guys, you know. That's why we were there was to pour our hearts out for those guys. Um, I remember a few of those gigs. I'm trying to think what else. Uh, I used to play, I was in this band that played Creation Fest. We used to play at a club on a Sunday night. It was called Stained Glass Sundays. And my wife was the booking agent for this club. And that's a whole story how the club let Christian music in. But we had some really fun nights there playing with that band on that stage. I had a lot of good times with that band. Um, Another one from the Christian era of the 80s when I was in the band that did the record in Nashville. We did a tour in uh, Spokane, Washington. And we I flew there, but the band took our equipment over there. And they almost had massive accidents on the way back home coming through black ice and stuff. This was November. They're traveling across the country on I-80. It was crazy. But um, there were some memorable gigs there. And the memories were more about what happened after the gig or how we lost money or how product got stolen and stuff than the actual playing. But there were some interesting nights there or basically going to a uh, Christian bookstore to do a record signing and nobody came. You know, <laughs> that was funny. That was crazy. So, yeah, I've been through some interesting stuff in my career. No doubt about it. I will say the most my f greatest experiences, though with some of the places I've recorded. Um, I recorded in Nashville, Hummingbird Studios in Nashville. And even though I got axed on the sixth song of that album, the Stay By Grace Alive and Kicking album, I had the greatest drum lesson of my life from John Hammond. I talk about that in the John Hammond um, Modern Drummer issue that we talked about John Hammond and his brother Mark. And I talk about that experience. I've talked about it here before. That was an amazing time. I also did I also did some demos at a studio in New York called The Magic Shop, which is no longer there, with that band Water. And we went into New York City in the village and we recorded in The Magic Shop. And it was just a, a magical studio with a Neve wraparound console and everything. So I've, I've been able to record some interesting music with some interesting people over the years. And I had a couple other gigs in New Jersey where I recorded that... They were very memorable. Um, and of course, coming down here to Florida, I having my own studio and recording people has been pretty memorable too. So anyhow, that's some of it. I just touched on a lot of stuff. If any of you guys have any questions, you want me to elaborate for another show, I'll go in deeper into the stories. But that was pretty much it. All right. Well, that's it. Four questions. Ask girl anything. Didn't try to be fast this week. I'm not worried about the camera going out. I just charged the battery before we started this. Uh, your questions make the show. I appreciate your questions. Thank you for watching and have a great day. Bye.